another way of looking, so exposure is the systematic bias in selected messages that um, diverges from the composition of what is accessible. Um, for example, if you're looking at eight um, news items on a website, you might be reading just one of them. You're ignoring seven of them, or just check them out briefly. If you read one of them in uh, depth, that would be a bias, if you will, um, because you're not um, using uh, 25 or 20 percent of your time for one, and so forth. Oh, I have to do too much math to this way. <laughs> if you were to um, spread your time uh, proportionally, there would be no bias in selective exposure, you will, but almost always. I mean, we never spend an equal amount of time for what is accessible to us. There will always be some sort of bias. And my interest is why are you spending your time with that particular movie, that message, that radio channel, or whatever it is? Doesn't mean it's across the board um, where I study. It seems like a lost of word messages, of accessible magic messages, but you know, but I'm talking about that. Alright, so um, given that, um, given this very broad approach to selective exposure, I've been using a lot of different theories over the years. So selective exposure is pretty much a dependent variable, it's a phenomenon, and then I draw on a lot of different theories to explain why we um, pick something, how we are influenced by it. I won't go through all these theories, I'm just trying to know. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that you can um, utilize to predict um, what people, uh, people select and how they influenced. Um, so, you'll hopefully remember the theory, the theory. <laughs> so here we go. Um, and then in terms of methodology, there's a lot of different ways of measuring certain exposure. The approach that I have um, used most frequently is computerized um, tracking of what people select. The computer is a marvelous tool um, when it comes to uh, tracking what people um, read for how long, you can randomize the sequence in which the things are shown and so forth. So it's a marvelous tool to track selective exposure, but I've also used videotaping, analog tracking. Um, a classic approach is to have a specific device or remote control that tracks when people watch the channels they pick. Um, if I get to it, I'll talk about showing book covers or video covers and ask people what you want to watch or read. So there's a million different ways of measuring this. And one thing that I want to bring home, <laughs> you can measure selective exposure pretty easily. If you look at my work, oftentimes I've been using software, but you might as well do a much simpler thing if you bring more material. <laughs> Which of these two would you want to read? And have people pick one of the two and have maybe more of those and just maybe take them and it's very simple. I like to encourage to play. It's not that complicated. It's not rocket science. You don't have to have a program or what have you. Um, so you can have all kinds of um, creative ways of measuring this. Um, Thank you. 
here. Yeah. All the choices. Let's see what kind of pencil you pick for, okay? Um, so I'm hoping to learn about your interests um, because I love getting new ideas. <laughs> Oftentimes my work is really sort of channeled by people who come to me and oh, look at this. And for some reason a student might be drawn to my teaching style or whatever and comes up with a topic and buy it. Never want you to study body image, it's so depressing. But I had a student who was interested in it and absolutely wanted to do the study, so I ended up, I think I had three or four studies from all that. But it's, of course, fascinating and important. Um, so I like to broaden and look at new things. So, whatever you feel like could be studied with this methodology or sort of perspective, I'd be very curious to hear about it. So I'll give you some, I'll force you probably it's going to be interesting to um, talk more about what could be relevant. Um, so as I go further down my outline here, I'll look at select studies that I've done in the various domains. Let me just highlight, I've had a lot of help over the years. So these are just some of my current or recent um, students. So I want to certainly note that they've been helping me a lot and have inspired me. Um, she's a Texas Tech alumni, so I should be running into her. <laughs> and um, Laura is not a big but Benjamin Johnson is a Texas Tech University of Amsterdam. And these are my current students, so they've been helping me a lot. And you will see more co-authors as I um, go through the various studies. So just want to highlight, I'm certainly not doing this all by myself. So, I want to give you maybe just a brief, a taste, if you will, of the model that I've developed based on um, the work um, over the years. I think I, I didn't read it in somewhere here. Um, sort of a summary of all these studies that I've done um, are published in a book that came out this year. Um, and so, the uh, bottom line of the book is the model based on these studies, and I won't drag you through all the little boxes, <laughs> just give, want to give you a taste of it, if you will, and talk about some key assumptions um, that inspire a lot of my current work um, based on this model. I like to think um, of media users as being very dynamic in the way they think about themselves. This is very much based on um, the psychological concept of dynamic self, and I thought a football player would be a great example to sort of, you know, so I wanted to illustrate that. And it's not so much about the looks, but the idea, you are not that stable person. You think about yourself in different moments in very different ways. And right now, I think of myself academic. See me at home with my boys and my mom, you know. <laughs> They're like, what? You do science? Mom, never, you know. So it's a very different way of thinking about myself moment, um, and there's a lot of different examples along these lines. Sometimes you think of yourself as a voter, as a taxpayer, or a partisan um, in blue and well. So, as an athletic person maybe. So at a given moment in time, you think about yourself in a particular way. And to me, media use is a marvelous way of, of sort of shaping how you think about yourself. So when I pick this, that would probably make me think very much about my inability of <laughs> understanding Spanish, for instance, um, being German, being, living in the States, and what have you. So depending on what is in front of me, it makes me think about myself in a different way. If I look at this, I feel very competent, but I look at this, not so much. <laughs> so looking at different messages, um, that will trigger very different self-perceptions. And I think a lot of, us, of the selections that we make every day um, we bring certain aspects of ourselves to the forefront. Like maybe if you're reading in the morning the political coverage, that makes you feel like you're a good citizen and a well-informed person. Um, so it might bolster certain aspects about yourself that you like. Um, and that to me is a fascinating way of, of thinking, conceptualizing why we do messages. Um, so we don't have a state of self-concept, Working, situational, accessible self, not all aspects of yourself are uh, accessible at a given moment, so 
right now, I wouldn't think of myself as mom. <laughs> um, so, and that self-perception then will also strongly affect behavior. So this sort of experience of thinking so intensely about my work might inspire me to do more research, or if, let's say, you're reading Men's Health, something along these lines probably exists in the States, you're like, okay, I'm gonna go to the gym later. So thinking about yourself more as an athlete, maybe because you look at certain messages that in turn affects your behavior. And I think we do this habitually, we do it very often in the morning, reading the newspaper, or maybe you're trying to motivate yourself to go to the gym later on, or to eat healthy, or whatever it is. Um, you might then pick up messages or magazine that will push you in whatever direction, whatever you want to sort of, um, how you want to think about yourself, and that influence in turn, you know, um, I think should let that sink. So why don't you, let's see, is there anything that pops up? And I'll give you a moment while I drink some water. Is there anything that comes to mind where you're like, okay, wait, this is something I have to myself that's shaping my behavior, or my, my reading, that interpreting my behavior, what would be an interesting thing to say? I'm going to have some Solidarity. 
is a case of responsibility. For example, solidarity is to increase my positive feelings. Oh, I am a good citizen. I am. It's a case of responsibility. So, well, yes. To I think it's yeah, that's okay. a whole different thing. Yeah, but different people will probably have different ways of thinking about it. I should be doing that because I'm responsible, or because at the end of the day, I think we do a lot of things to feel good about ourselves. Yeah, about ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So feeling responsible or expressing solidarity and all that, it, it all makes us feel better about ourselves, and it's it's a natural process. I think that's just how people are sort of functioning. It's not. It's not a bad thing, that's how we are probably set up. Uh -huh. But in the other side, we are engaged in a uh, research about good image. In the other side, we have the opposite. The, the opposite image is that you feel very bad because you are not fit in this model. So, and you feel, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> feel anger or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, you feel guilty right. about that. Yeah. Right? So, the positive. I think I want to come back to that. <laughs> something I missed, but um, now I'm trying to write a research project for the European uh, Council, mm -hmm. and it's focused on something called, I don't know if we, you know, uh, transhumanism. Yeah? So um, it has uh, hard implications on the way we uh, conceive ourselves, mm -hmm. not just as individuals, but uh, as society or as human beings, as beings, in fact. Yeah? You can go, if you are here or today or tomorrow, you can go to the CCCB, the Center for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona, mm -hmm. and there's an exposition about um, more humans. Yeah? So, transhumanism is that uh, the uh, non biologically enhancement of human beings. Yeah? So, it's not related to values, but it's related, in fact, to this me metaphor that is being used continuously as um, a human being, as a machine or a computer. Yeah? So, I don't know whether you have uh, analyzed it or not, but it has uh, hard implications on the way we see think about ourselves. We think about mm -hmm. ourselves. I'm not talking about myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Not talking about you, or not talking about anyone in particular. If you compare yourself to computers, then you might think about yourself well, in a different it's, way. It's, yeah, it's a long story. Uh, this metaphor has been used for, for centuries almost, yeah, from the beginning of the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution, the man as a machine, to the uh, Information Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, as the man as a computer. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a little bit weird. I'm saying your uh, it's expressions. <laughs> 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 Compare um, yourself with a computer, but I mean, well, there's a lot of models. I don't know if you're familiar with the model that like, comes out of Stanford that we interact with machines as if they are yeah. people. So that's a little bit related. So. I, would, I think we also related that to, and, and probably I am mistake, but to this trend in, in science itself. Yeah? You know what you said yesterday, and what we are doing all the time numbers, stats, numbers, stats, numbers, stats. Yeah? The way we describe mm -hmm. human beings, it's not through qualitative uh, <coughs> methods. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. But, uh, Let me get back to that as well. Yeah, yeah. I have stuff for you guys uh, that will speak so to that. In my opinion, it's a trend that we can mm -hmm. appeal to, to the everybody. Everyone is talking. Uh, now about the possibility that we can be non biologically enhanced in 20 years. Yeah? I know, I know, I don't believe in that. So it's not me. Mm -hmm. Just asking mm -hmm. how it could uh, well, what, what affect that? or impact yeah. in the. Maybe I can come up with a connection here. It makes me think of the, of the fact that we all have these apps now. Or I know Emma has a. Like she comes and steps that she's watching. So she is thinking about herself as a walker in America, choice, if you will. But we all, I mean, you, okay, how many emails did I get today? How many friends do I have on Facebook? We think about ourselves oftentimes in America. What is, and that reminds me a little bit. Not just that, but uh, in the 
regarding the sad exposure, you know that uh, it's difficult to concentrate the content today. Any content, right. just your content, your message, probably in 20 minutes I will be thinking about something else and we will be talking about okay. it. And <laughs> no, 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 it happens the same. It happens the same to us, to all of us. So we are more and more behaving, not just as we used to behave in the past, as, as pure information computing machines, but it's just a, um, a proposition. <laughs> it's not like I would like you to, to solve it, not yeah. So I don't know whether you have think about that um, when you have been analyzing selective exposure, because the exposure is something that uh, probably may change the world itself. Yeah, it's, it's so dynamic. It's it so is extremely dynamic. Yeah. It, it, it can be applied to pretty much any content, but um, with the computerized perception or the numeric perception of ourselves or other people, I think you do see that already, that um, all these apps that we're using to track all kinds of mm -hmm. things, like how many citations do you have now, how many calories, how many clips you have so far, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of, the computer helps us think about ourselves in a lot of numeric ways, if you will. But then again, also qualitative, like all these images that we're taking, all these pictures that we're taking, and I might look at my phone, I have my phone in a picture or whatever, and it makes me think about a certain experience, and it brings that back to the forefront, and makes me maybe think about vacation in Germany, and me in Germany, or whatever is on my phone, or on your phone. So Facebook itself is, is a huge, like, okay, how would I like to think about myself, and how others think about myself, and I selectively will put things, it could be numbers, or it could be qualitative information. Hmm. Alright, <laughs> let's just see where we're going with more of this. So the model um, includes some propositions, um, and my plan at least is, I don't know how much detail we put into all these steps, but my idea is that those propositions will then be illustrated with studies in the various fields and I might skip the one or the other study based on what I've heard about your interest. So one proposition is that a lot of our computer media use um, serves to increase coherence and positivity of self concept. Coherence, um, let me start with coherence and I'll go to position number two later. So the idea first of all is um, computer media use oftentimes serves to just increase coherence going back to the idea, our self perception is very dynamic. You want to have some coherence, you want to think about yourself in a particular stable way, but it's not a given. So we do a lot, habitually, to stabilize how we think about ourselves. And one, like the classic um, application that context is um, confirmation bias along the lines of political messages, um, and that's a study that uh, we did before the 2008 um, presidential election. Um, let me illustrate how those studies might have work and I've done follow-up work. So you would see eight articles and there's always two articles on the same topic. So let's say you want to have personalized health coverage. People are um, in favor of, I pay for my own um, insurance, so I'm responsible for what um, I'm doing. I don't want to pay for all these slackers <laughs> who don't make enough money. Or on the other hand, you might want to have Spanish law, universal health care, everybody has access. So depending on your political um, attitude, and it's a contentious issue in the United States, you would go here and read that, spend more time reading that, or go here if you're more of the right um, way of orientation. Um, so we would then track what people um, read, and we would before and after measure their um, attitudes, so I would just show you um, do you oppose or support stricter gun control? And then if you support stricter gun control, uh, this would be um, dissonant for you because this is saying guns are great, you need guns. <laughs> or if you're thinking um, you don't want to have stricter gun control, guns kills kids, that would be dissonant. It would um, contradict your um, view. So depending on your attitudes, and what you pick that exposure, that type of exposure would be categorized as consonant or dissonant. And then um, the more time you spend with selective exposure to consonant messages, um, the greater
greater will be, or the, you will see an increase in the accessibility of these attitudes. So those attitudes will be reinforced. You're reading about guns are great, if that's what you believe. Um, and that would then also in turn even increase the accessibility of your right wing orientation. So that's something that you can nicely demonstrate after some, it's not so, sounds so smooth and easy, <laughs> after a lot of statistical headache, you get there, you can demonstrate that well, of course, it's a well-established pattern by now. We prefer consonant messages that then increases the accessibility of these attitudes and that makes your self-perception, if you will, along the lines of political views, partnership, more accessible. So you're reinforcing your political self-concept through certain stories. So that's one demonstration, if you will, of this. Um, do I get back to Yes. So this is an illustration of how we increase the coherence, the stability of our self-perception. Um, so political is one example. Now, gender identity is another big one. <laughs> um, okay, big nod in that. Um, we had a little discussion about it over dinner also. Um, so, a lot of these magazines, for instance, that I was looking at yesterday, Um, there's a lot of those women's magazines, and the guys will read sports magazines, I suppose. Um, so we wanted to see how that then affects um, uh, the selective reading of magazines, how that affects their gender conformity. It's almost a given, women read women's magazines, guys will read game, computer game stuff, business magazines, sports illustrated and all that. That's not a dog. <laughs> Thing to study and found like a huge, very, very clear patterns. It's amazing. So we wanted to go beyond that and see how it affects people. And if this is working, no, of course not. So just make it a little. I just wanted to make it a little bit more um, vivid. Oh, well, there's not, they're not talking. It's just an illustration how you can relatively easily study selective exposure. So this guy is doing what we all do every day. He picks something, um, spends some time reading, and this is a very easy way of studying selective exposure. It's very much like doing this. And whatever you're so interested in, you could line up in front of people and just tape it, and then um, what we use is YouTube videos, um, segmenting software to cut it into inner levels and have people code it. It's, it's not it's not rocket science, um, but it's a beautiful way of tracking what's going on, uh, what people spend their time with. So here we have, as it's Sports Illustrated, the resolution is not great. It's really just to track what people do. It's not to demonstrate how beautiful these magazines are, obviously. And here were all the women's magazines. So just a little demonstration of how you can um, track selective exposure. And collaborating with me. And then, of course, we were interested in how that affects and how people think about themselves. So, first of all, we saw that um, biological sex will, of course, predict whether you think of yourself as more feminine or masculine. And then, both these things actually influence what you choose, how much time you spend with women's magazines, with relatively neutral time magazine news week. Um, or whether you end up reading Sports Illustrated, and that in turn then um, your gender conformity post selective exposure. We used the bend sexual immaturity, which has terms that are um, associated with femininity and masculinity. So, again, um, this is an additional illustration um, of how we increase our self perception, how the coherence, um, not just political self perception. It's another way of thinking about how we increase the stability of how we think of ourselves. Something as mundane <laughs> as reading magazines uh, will very much shape how you think about yourself uh, and how you interact with others, what you perceive as norms. Um, all right, all that about coherence so far. Now let me talk a little bit about positivity also. This is so far just increasing stability or coherence, if you will. But oftentimes, as I uh, 
touch on uh, briefly, you want to feel great about yourself. Um, and one way of doing that is um, social identity theory approach was used for the study is to look at different portrayals of people in magazines or news uh, media. So we used um, portrayals of uh, people, of African Americans and uh, white, of Caucasian Americans. Um, they, you would have two distractors, but then you would have um, positive articles about white individuals. Is it a positive one? No. This is a negative one, obviously. He loses his job. So you have a negative news item about a white guy, and then you have a positive news item about a white guy, um, um, a positive article about a black woman, and so forth. So we would vary the race on the portrayed individuals and the context, whether it was positive or negative. Tested everything. <laughs> everything established very cleanly that everybody would clearly see this is a white woman and this is positive and what have you. So you have to go through all these camera loops, make sure people perceive the way you think they will. Um, and then we used African American participants, white, uh, white participants and uh, tracked what they would select. And here is what we found. We found primarily uh, black readers, if you will, discriminate. Um, for them, it's more salient what their race is. For whites, their race isn't as salient because that's normal. <laughs> but for African Americans, because they're an American minority, you find that in a lot of different contexts, their race is more salient to them. So it does affect their choices more strongly, and they choose primarily positive articles about African Americans. They have a general um, greater, general greater interest um, in coverage about their own race, if you will. If they go and read about white individuals, they prefer negative. And that's sort of a self bolstering um, pattern, if you will. I don't have a graph or anything on that. But the more time they spend in this, um, with this pattern of self bolstering selective exposure, the greater their self esteem is after this selective reading. So they are also feeling better about themselves if they read more positive stuff about their own race and read more negative stuff about their uh, the other group, if you will. It's not the same for white Americans. Um, for them, their race is this. You do see a little bit of the pattern, but it's not something possibly ever get to that sort of pattern. Comments? Questions? Um, I guess, um, can you explain uh, some more about uh, the methodology? How do you select the mm -hmm. sample and what um, did they know about the whole like, mm -hmm. idea? Yeah, yeah, right there. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go through this okay. very, and very superficial level to cover a lot of stuff. So I'm glad to talk more about how we went about this. I think in this study we had 25 participants, half of them um, African Americans, half of them white, um, and these were students. So it's not like a wonderful <laughs> representative sample. Um, how much do they know? They don't know anything. They would just look at, read whatever you're interested in. They have no clue what this is about. So. That's a big, like, I, I would never want to have, uh, have them know what's going on because if, they, if you tell them this is about blood, yeah. then they, 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 they will be able on these lines. And um, the guy was waiting for. Oh, the guy. Um, um, good question. Let me. Because it's like, yeah. okay, you can wait here and if you want to read something uh, in five minutes, yes. we will be chat. Yeah. Um, that would be ideal. Sometimes it's a little hard to make that point. But um, I think the way we explained it in that study, we had them take the gender conformity test on the computer, and then we told them, okay, before you take the next part of this uh, research session, um, we'll have you read some um, magazines just as so that you clear your head, get some time just to grab some mag magazines. I mean, the number we had to have there, so I don't know how much they, yeah. but we tried to play it down.
then I might as well but sit at home and <laughs> read something because that's all right for me. But now I have some good to read. That maybe if they have the smartphone because maybe they decide not to read the magazines and to we, we tell them you can leave your stuff up front, okay. turn up your phone, it will be distracting and uh, distract people. So yeah, we don't want that. <laughs> Unless some um, of my students want to study multitasking, so sometimes you might take an interest. So in the future, to make it more naturalistic, maybe we'll allow them to use their phone. I mean, in a way, we're forcing them to look at magazines, <laughs> or they could just stare in the air. That's possible too. So for the full choices, they might be able to use their phone in the future. But then you have so much. There's so much variance that. You don't want the phone ringing and all that. Yeah. Thanks for making me cover the details here. Um, all right. Where was I? Did I already? I talked about positivity, right? Okay. So, take home point, if you will. So far, we use a lot of a lot of habitual media use, a lot of media use that we're engaging in helps us to feel to create stability, but also to feel good about ourselves. Now, uh, a huge part of my work also looks at how we manage our affect um, and adapt to situational requirements. Let me tell you a little bit about sort of the roots of that. When I started with such exposure, I felt very much mood management. So let me take you back to something that I did a long time ago. But it is a nice illustration of how we use media to also regulate our affect. It's not just how we think of ourselves, you know that and affect often plays together. But often we also just want to um, influence our own mood states. What we did, I should first tell you, uh, in this study we placed people in a good mood, in a neutral mood, or in a negative mood. How do we do that? We show them, we give them a, a test. Um, this is an important test of your ability to recognize facial expressions which is a very important skill, and then they see images of facial expressions depending on your parental group. Wrong, 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 wrong. Or, hey, perfect, you're really awesome at recognizing emotional expressions. So you put them in different emotional states, and then you allow them to regulate their mood <laughs> through media. So let's just say you just took a test, or you just got an um, exam back, or you got a terrible grade, if you will, or you got a good grade. So that's sort of what this is mimicking, but we want to make sure that they bring a certain affect to it, and you can see this was still done when I was in Germany. We want to see, do people use more information if they are in a good or bad mood? Do they use more positive, well this is negative, or positive messages? So, um, we had eight sites here, half of them were informational, half of them were entertaining. So this would be an information piece, negative, and this is sort of a short story, also with a spooky kind of negative, but in entertaining. Now you can think about what would you use if you're in a general mood? Would you read more information? Would you read something positive? What would you do? So it's a little funny to look at this 13 years later. I, I still think it's not too bad. You know, it's such a long time ago, but I still like to look at this study and I think it's been informative. Um, so if I place you in a bad mood, um, see this is positively balanced material. People in a bad mood will spend more time um, with positive messages. People in a mediocre mood spend less time with positive. And then what was a bit surprising for us, people in a good mood, they were apparently not so, they were doing all kinds of things. They were not preoccupied with improving their mood, if you will. And what is nice here, it's also tracking this across time. So this is across time. Uh, they had currently five minutes. So um, pretty much across the board, people in bad mood would spend more time with positive messages <clears throat> than people in a mediocre mood. But the people with good mood and good mood state were like not so consistent. Apparently improving their mood was not so much on their minds. But relatively clear here for the information exposure I'm looking at uh, information slides. So if you are in a good mood, you read more information. If you are in a negative mood, you are more looking for entertainment, which is typically more effective in fixing your mood, if you will. So whether you look at information or entertainment depends on your mood state. Entertainment, uh, entertainment 
is more attractive if you're in a negative mood. <laughs> yes. Yeah. How did you measure the mood? Yes, I mm -hmm. mean observation or um, we place them in these different like I if I give you a test and then you fill out a piece of paper writing long responses and then depending <laughs> so, well, um, I would give you a terrible test feedback if I want to put you in a bad mood. As simple as that. You get ethical approval. <laughs> <laughs> we debrief them later on. They learn. This was all bogus, but it's very effective. This, I did this as a postdoc. I did a similar thing. You see them like, oh, they are sinking a little bit in front of the computer. It is effective. You're being told your emotional regulation skills stick. So it's more drastic than a lot of the. But then again, let's say on Facebook, somebody tells you, well, you, this was stupid what you just did. There's all kinds of instances in everyday life that might put you in a negative mood. And we just manipulate that mentally so that we can clearly show how it affects what people choose. Of course, you can. There's all kinds of um, how ecologically valid is it? Does it reflect what's really going on in the real world? It's a representation, I guess. So far, so good. Or question? I have no idea when. When did I start my career? I've done a lot of crap. So this is one um, demonstration of how moods and affect influence um, what we pick, and often we not only want to improve our mood, we might also anticipate something that will happen maybe in 30 minutes or in an hour. Maybe in an hour you have an important meeting, you're sitting in your office, okay, I want to get a raise from my boss. I need to be really firm when I get into this office, or whatever it is, whatever you're anticipating that you'll need to do. So that sort of behavior regulation, you want to maybe put yourself in a particular mood. Let me show you how we're Looking at that, that sometimes you use the media to prepare yourself to do something. Um, so in this study, when you see a little bit of a, um, this is what people would get either terrible feedback for their mood um, or well, for their emotional condition um, task. Um, this is, I think, the negative. Yeah, they all in this study they all got negative, and then. The, the supervisor would also supposedly send a note, this is a terrible performance, I've never seen worse results, something like that. So it would provoke them on top of that. You did poorly, and this is awful. So you get a personal message. And then what is interesting about this study, half of those in the study were told, um, after you completed the session, you get to evaluate the supervisor. So you get to retaliate. <laughs> <laughs> So you're being provoked pretty drastically, but then you also learn, hey, I get to evaluate this person, I can let them know how terrible this is. And the other half of the sample did not anticipate that. They would just go, okay, great, thank you, and probably be angry. So we manipulated um, their anticipation of being able to retaliate or not. So let's just say you've got this terrible feedback. Oh, and throw a message. And then we said, okay, now we're getting to study two of the session. Please just browse these um, news articles, read whatever you find interesting. Half of them had tweeted, half of them were very negative news items, half of them were positive. What would you read? <laughs> and somebody just.
very frequently references social comparisons and um, in my work or in, my, in the way I theor think about the theoretical processes, I very often use social comparison theory. I don't know how, how prevalent that is here. Fessinger's basic idea was we um, compare ourselves with others to evaluate ourselves, but sometimes um, the more modern psychological book would also say we might want to do self-enhancement to feel better about ourselves by looking at people who are um, worse than we are, or almost oh, maybe there's yet other um, um, processes at work. So taking this whole mood management line of work further, how do we use things like Facebook um, to improve our moods? People, at least in the States, spend a lot of energy. Oh, you just reminded me of that thing. <laughs> um, in the United States, spend a lot of time with Facebook, and we were interested in how does mood management play to that? Do we use social networking sites? Oh, sure. Yeah. To manage our moods. <laughs> and I think social comparison is the perfect theoretical framework to conceptualize what is going on. Do you want to read how awesome your friends are doing? Everybody's getting a raise, and I don't know what. Um, so, this was sort of what we were interested in. How does this um, mood management and social comparison play into this? So, we did the same thing. We put them in a terrible mood or a good mood, so, you know. And then the male participants would look at this, um, if you will, fake social networking site and would look at all male profiles. Um, we wanted to have similarity in the social comparison process. And then, I hope you can infer what we manipulated. Attractiveness, hotness rating, career success. <laughs> we have a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, so here, for instance, you have someone doing poorly in, in career terms, doing poorly in romantic terms. This guy is doing great in romantic terms, but not so great financially, so let's see. This guy has it all. So what do you want to read? If you were just told. Let's see. Let's see if you have any more insights than cultural differences. They told credit. Huh?
place in a negative mood. So, bottom line is, um, I guess, so I'm taking you back here. Oh, I should be, sorry, that's not the slide that I wanted to go to. So, the idea here is that I'm trying not to look at the processes that are at work. Priming is one, and social comparison to me is a very important process of how um, mass media make us think about ourselves in certain, in certain ways, how do they affect our moods, and how we selectively attend those. Finally, we get to body image. So, do we always do this? Do we always want to? How does it work then? And when it comes to how, why would we look at all these perfect models? Why would we ever look at all these magazines with people who look perfect, have a model body, make a lot of money? Why would we ever do that to ourselves? Yeah. So um, I think earlier you said um, it makes us feel terrible about ourselves to, to look at these perfect. Photoshopped models. Why do we buy the magazines then? Why do we watch movies with all these perfect looking people? That's a big paradox, isn't it? Because they don't feel angry, angry. they feel insecurity and anxiety, um, and they mm -hmm. feel to uh, some way they are unstructured. But then we should not ever look at these magazines, right? They don't. But who's selling these magazines? Why are we still then? I mean, somebody needs to buy those magazines, right? <laughs> I think the industry would respond pretty quickly to. I mean, one thing that I just showed you, you know, in a way, we really like to look at positive difference. How people are. Beautiful, don't break. You generate an anxiety mood and you feel uh, and the subject individual <coughs> considers that it's my fault to be uh, to not to be so so pretty. It's yeah. my fault yeah. to feel anxiety and my mood right. is depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the message. Mm -hmm. Your Anybody can look like that, why don't you look so perfect? Still paradox why we spend, why, why are you buying these magazines, right? Because we want to compare ourselves. We compare ourselves? That's true. I don't know what magazines here, but people magazine mistakes. Look at her ugly outfit, or look at how fat she looks in that particular picture. <laughs> That's that. Sometimes they allow us to do, I don't know, I'm still not double comparison, but make fun of people. And, and, and also, all the possibilities that there are uh, gross messages. In some way, you are seeing the, the idea of perfection. Mm -hmm. And I feel anxious, I feel I'm not angry. I mm -hmm. feel anxious because I, I can't achieve this mm -hmm. moment. But on the other side, in the same magazine, mm -hmm. they explain to me how to cheat. Uh -huh. so go go and, right. it. Yeah. and the far you are from this model, the more you can see later. If you do it's that, you will be uh, something. Yes, I agree. Yeah. They would never tell you it's your fault that you... You are almost there, aren't you? Just yeah. diet for three days and you look you have a solution. They don't say it's your fault. Oh. Now let me tell you how I'm getting to, I was jumping <laughs> through the study then. So you do see a lot of those images. So what we did is we had um, a magazine on a computer. The magazine would show ads like that for the women. Um, half of the ads were normal people where the body was out of focus. So you would have, I don't know, a banking ad and half of the ads looked like Super yeah. body, what have you? And depending on the gender, you would. So um, Louise would see this, Emma would see this, right? <laughs> and then we had two experimental groups. <laughs> we had two experimental groups. Um, half of the experimental.
instrumental uh, sample would get messages like this. So, so the editorial context was just two minutes away or one work out away from perfection. And the other half of the sample got messages that had nothing to do with body image. So what we found is independent still when you get something else, whether you will satisfy or not with your body, then affected how you responded. So if you saw body irrelevant editorial context and you did not like the look of your body, you would not look at these perfectly shaped, photoshopped creatures. <laughs> uh, but if they tell you, you can do it, you're dissatisfied now, well, but just buy my product, do this, I don't know what. You would spend a lot of time eating well, the same, pretty much, as people who like their bodies, who women are not worried about. So, yeah, I think you were right on the money, and they tell you, hey, go for it. So this idea of attainability um, very much changes how you come. So upper comparison is no longer upper comparison, it's you're almost like these people. So they create this illusion and that people are more willing to look at these um, uh, idealized body um, shapes. And I think that's similar for a lot of different, um, like you can be as rich, you can be blah blah blah, but body shapes um, very much are a great context to, to show how um, attainability very much changes the way social comparisons will affect us. So if you're being told you can be best at letting just do it, buy Nike shoes and you'll be as fast as, I don't know, Michael Jordan or whatever, then you feel like you can affiliate with these super athletes or whatever. Yes? Uh, just a question. Uh, you don't tell, told, uh, you don't tell us whether you are more more close to a minimal effects paradigm or to a um, powerful effects, yeah? I think that probably you are close to a minimal effects paradigm. And my question is, compared to face-to-face -to -face social comparison effect, what is the effect of mediated social comparison? So we are talking about that. But uh, I would really like to know your opinion about what is the really impact of these images in comparison mm, to, to the person. effects of those girls that study with me and mm -hmm. those people that... Uh, yeah. Well, I think the first drastic difference is you have a lot of choices. You have a lot more choices for some comparisons in the mediated context. What you encounter in a personally is limited itself, thank you for No, but I mean, the media give you, you meet hundreds of people just by flipping through the channels, just by browsing a magazine, as opposed to how many people do you, I mean, interpersonally, unless you walk well, if you go down less or less, there's a lot of social comparison to activities, but a lot of like that. So, but you don't know that much about them. Here, it's a clear dimension what you're supposed to compare yourself with. If someone is walking down the avenue, you don't know, I mean, you don't see how rich, how romantically successful, or anything. You don't, you don't we, get this. We don't know that, but we can imagine. And we're doing all the time. <laughs> True. So, yeah? If you don't admit uh, yeah. you, we are yes, so the we are always we going up, up right? All the time. Yes. Yeah. That is true. Mm -hmm. um, so the main difference might be, I don't know, maybe you are selectively comparing yourself to interpersonally. Could be. Yeah. I mean, I like to think about this as being the perfect abundant choice environment. It also helps you to think about, I don't know, if you want to change your body shape, get yourself stressed out, look at this stuff, and focus more on it. Or if you want to think more about money, maybe compare yourself with rich people or career successful people. Um, maybe it's not that different. But this takes us to another uh, completely different field. It's um, selective exposure mm -hmm. in uh, real social relationships. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, and they I try to to, to to relate yeah. with these uh, yeah. friends because yeah. maybe you will. Yeah, and Facebook does allow you. It's sort of in between computer mediated and, and interpersonal, so it's it's a little blurry. But maybe the processes aren't all. Oh. Uh -huh.
um, what we've been looking at so far, these were experiments that last 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That's not what we do. That's not the sort of media impact that you're faced with as you spend maybe a week or, or well, every day with media. So what we were interested in is, or what I'm doing more and more now, is what's happening over a long period of time. Let's go beyond 15-20 minutes because this accumulates. These effects accumulate over days and weeks, over our lives, if you will. So I want to get a little bit, a glimpse at least, at these processes. I can never <laughs> study um, that easily um, across a very long time span, but what we're doing here, we did a prolonged selective exposure study, which means for four days, if you are in our sample, you would um, get to choose from magazines. So, um, this is sort of neutral, and here we had um, career women portrayals, we had only women in the study, or parenting portrayals, or the beauty stuff. And we wanted to see if you have a certain like, focus in how you think about yourself, would you keep reinforcing that through those selective uh, media exposure sessions, and how does that affect you then um, in cumulative fashion? So this is taking it sort of to the next level, go beyond just five minutes or what you know, because this is happening all the time, and it's probably affecting how we plan our lives, how we think about our relationships, what career decisions we make, all this is probably channeled, fostered by all the little messages that we consume every day and that we select every day. So we wanted to get a glimpse of that. So that's sort of the latest that um, we're getting into. Um, let me just make sure, because that's a very different <laughs> and complicated design. So I would invite participants, they fill out a questionnaire, how important being a parent is to them in the future, how important um, uh, being a romantic partner is to them, um, now and in the future, and having a career, how important is that to them in the future. And then, a few days later, we invite them to take the study. For four days, they get to make these choices. I think every day they would make four choices and read magazine pages, I think, 20 each day, which is still small. If you can't demonstrate effects with just a few pages of magazine exposure, I said, I'm going to be blown away. This has cost me so much money, but I want to know if this works. <laughs> So it's, it's a crazy endeavor because this, this is like twelve thousand dollars just to pay people um, to come back to your study every day, and then after four days we waited two days, and then they fill out another questionnaire to see hey how important is career in the future for you? How important is being your mental partner and all that? Now what would you think? What's happening? Of course I wouldn't be showing this if it didn't work out, right? So <laughs> the Especially being a romantic partner showed a very clear pattern. If being a partner in the future, a romantic partner was important to these women, they spent uh, a lot of time with the beauty magazines and that reinforced then their um, selective uh, well, their um, self perception as a romantic partner in the future. And what do you, uh, I'm not sure that I can show this because the real interesting stuff is in the fine print. So what you can demonstrate with mediation um, analyses is that this works through this. Um, there is a mediated pattern, I have to read my own fine print. Um, the more important it is for you to be a romantic partner in the future, the more you read the uh, beauty portrayals, and that in turn makes it more important for you. So you're reinforcing that. Um, but demonstrating, we do this to ourselves. We shape what we think about ourselves, and we do it with those messages that are so uh, polished and very much designed to represent these values. And I think that's what you what you study with them as well. What values are represented in the media, and we utilize them to reinforce certain values in ourselves. I think I'll leave it at that to allow some for questions. Da -da.
Yes, please go ahead. Uh, what about the proposition and the same mm -hmm. concept? Uh, I would like to send you my research. And yes. Uh, because what I'm, I'm, my piece is about uh, the new wave of social movements, like within my movement, the yeah. movement. And, uh, my focus at the beginning wasn't a selective exposure, but uh, I, I did it then with this topic. And uh, what I found is like, that activists, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they use uh, a lot of social media to participate in the mm -hmm. movement and to get information. Mm -hmm. And if you compare my results, all my results are about activists mm -hmm. to the uh, all the the society, the Spanish society, mm -hmm. and the young. Uh, Behavior, mm -hmm. uh, you can find that the results are really similar. So then I start, uh, I begin to ask me, okay, what is the difference? What are why do certain people do this and why do certain people not engage it? Or what do you mean with difference? Yeah, what I mean is like, okay, uh, activists used to have a different uh, information behavior, mm -hmm. but nowadays it's mm -hmm. like it's social media. Yeah. You know, it's like social media uh, is a characteristic itself of being an activist. So social media, but it's the same as the all society. So the what you were the content they create? No, the, the, the media that they consume. So my question is what means nowadays being an activist? If you have the same information behavior then, or similar information behavior. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the activists would very much argue with the proposition that they're doing the same. They are trying to yes. stir yes. society. Even though they're still they're using Facebook or whatever, but they are using very different, they're posting very different yeah, messages. Yes, that's true, the messages are different, but the media, you know, is the same. Like the, uh, for mm -hmm. example, the... Uh, Even though they might hate what they read. Yeah, the media. but the globalization movement, for example, they have in the media, and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now they are not creating their own media, they are using so why would they use the same media as other people if they are totally disagree what they use? Yeah, it's like if it's a, a characteristic, you know, like, like something that uh, identify an activist. So now maybe it's like mm -hmm. okay, the so, same concept. Yes, yeah, like maybe I can maybe I can speak to that maybe with the with the parallel example. Um, so it reminds me of the study that we did. We were trying to make sense of when do Americans ever read messages that criticize their own country? <laughs> so uh, never. <laughs> they do. Um, interestingly enough, we're surprised. Um, so sometimes you want to feel different from the rest of the society, and I think that's probably very much true for activists. So they would probably read messages in the mass media that are at least a little critical, or they might, when they read it, distance them. From these messages, like what I showed you a little while ago. Yeah. If the women read career portrayals, um, often they will distance themselves from these. So you can um, read those messages, but the way you compare is contrasting, it's not affiliating. So the processes can be just the opposite of, of what most people may do. Um, so that's probably a good way of explaining when they read those messages, like activists read mass media, they're probably processing them in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. So they might like to hate <laughs> what they read, whereas other people are like, oh, no, 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 I agree. Depending on the message. But yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think what you, what, what my, my, my gut feeling would be, you need to process or measure, capture how they feel, whether they affiliate or whether they contrast. Mm -hmm. And there's there's nice ways of measuring that. You would have, like, for instance, did you feel connected to the women you saw on these pages? Did you feel connected to the sources that the news came from? Do you feel similar to whatever the activists would, would be reading? So, do they affiliate or do they contrast? And often we feel it's so awesome that we think we're smarter <laughs> than the people that are portrayed in the news, or you might think, oh, I'm something beautiful, that's a career woman, or whatever. So, often we will contrast ourselves from certain messages or portrayals and feel awesome. <laughs> to do that. The only way you can also use uh, as an activist uh, the typical mass media to reinforce your own difference in yeah. front of the output because you, you are. Depends on the message. Uh, yeah. 
Because it's both the message and the way you think you about it. it. Normal people are reading that, but I yeah. can't understand which is in this case. I know what's really going on. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's true that now with social media, sometimes you are right to message that you are not looking for, like uh, social, uh, mass media message mm -hmm. from uh, Spanish newspaper, but mm -hmm. also I remember that they, they used to share a lot of information, a lot of uh, news information from the New York Times and mm -hmm. it's kind of... Uh, but they might still say, oh, this is uh, stupid, what they are writing. No, they were, they were proud that uh, we are in the New York Times. Oh, we are, oh okay. You mm -hmm. know, so it was kind of... Yeah, but they are really... They were really critics with mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mass media, but not with social media. That yeah. In some kind, they are also, this kind of media are also mass media. <laughs> yeah. so in some way, yeah. I mean, it's uh, for almost all the people who are young people use yeah. this kind of media, yeah. so you are not different from. But it's very complicated because so many different messages are being posted. So when you say social media, it, I think you cannot talk about that as one homogeneous. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. But it's like television. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, but you know, usually uh, activists, if they, when they used to create the our media, they didn't have the, um, you know, like the, the risk to um, to be eliminated, like mm -hmm. uh, to be delayed, delayed, deleted mm -hmm. uh, your media. But with social media, your profile could be eliminated, deleted, or you know. It's like but then you have to be really critical, right? For that happens. Right? It happens. It happens. Thank you.